Thank you, Pastor Bill. So this does conclude our study time, and we're going to move into our question and answer session, um, of which we don't have any yet, but rumor has it is that you are teaching at Parkland this Sunday. Yeah, I'll be preaching right here Sunday morning, 9.15, 11.15. Um, so if you want to come, please. If you don't want to come, uh, if you if you can go on uh, Facebook or YouTube and put in Calvary Parkland, and it should be there as well. Concluding the Philippian series uh, this Sunday morning. So tune in or show up again. You know, you know how to get here. So uh, any questions from the audience yet? Pastor Shad, as you were talking about that, on Sunday when we were worshiping, I was thinking about the songs of the Jewish songs from, you know, from Judaism, the songs in Christianity, the worship songs. And we were talking about Handel Messiah being one of the greatest, like God's theme song, right? I don't know of anything, I have never heard anything about worship songs from Muhammad or worship songs in Islam. Have you? Um, I haven't heard them. I haven't sought them out. And certainly where I look for music, they probably wouldn't be there. So I don't want to say yay or nay to it, but I, I'm certainly unaware of them. But, yeah. But I got to imagine in, in the Middle East and over there, they must be doing something like that, I would imagine. But I'd, have to, I'd have to check. I don't know anything about that. Sometimes we have a girl here that left Islam for Jesus. She's not here tonight, of course, when we meet her. But, um, but uh, she works at CCA. I'd love to ask her tomorrow. Hopefully come back next week with an answer. Yeah. Okay, so we do have one from the online audience, which reads, What do you tell a person who hasn't seen or experienced miracles, or quite frankly, have only experienced or seen negative events throughout their life? For example, their child dies of cancer or growing up in a third world country. Yeah, um, I think that's really two separate answers. Uh, as far as the miracles go, because they joined the club, I've not seen one. Uh, <clears throat> unless that girl is, is, is uh, she, she would be one. But I would think most people walk around saying they've never seen a miracle. Um, and again, we're not in the era of miracles, and Hebrews says Jesus is the last and the greatest revelation of God, so we shouldn't. Uh, expect them. We we can pray for miracles like with this girl and so forth. Because I think on an individual level, God does show up and do that. But um, if you if you want to get to the Bahamas, don't ask God to split the ocean. I don't think that's that scale of a miracle is going to happen again. Um, as far as the other uh, statement or question, um, that is a very very uh, deep. Um, a problem, if you want to call it that. Uh, you know, how do you how do you experience God and sense God? Um, like when you've lost a child. I mean, I don't know that I can even come near fathoming what that must be like. I don't know that I can. But I've been at memorials. For children, and I've listened to their parents speak at these memorials, and I can remember Kristen Dessinger, who was killed in an automobile accident. She was a senior at Calvary, and I remember at her memorial, her mother standing up and saying, "I will cry every day for the rest of my life." But then she said, "But I have a peace." that I'm going to make it be fine, that I can't describe to you. So there's nothing I can tell you today to, that you'll know what I'm experiencing as far as a piece of I can go on and I will manage this somehow, even though I'll cry every day for the rest of my life. And it's a piece that goes beyond explanation, is what she was sharing up there. Um, we lost a, a boy in another automobile accident. And at his memorial, 
her mother, his mother told him a remarkable story of the Sunday before he died. She was at worshiping at the church a little bit west of here, southwest of here. And um, the song from Jeremy Camp, they were singing, um, I will praise you in the storm. And she was singing that, and it was really on her mind about praising God in the storm. Well, this was a couple years ago, shortly before Christmas, when we were getting a ton of rain. And she gets the call that her son's car flipped over a ramp off of 595, and he plunged to his death. And she's called to the scene, and she's out there in the pouring rain uh, with all the medical people there, and her son's cab of his car was crushed and upside down on the road. and, And she said that song was playing in her head. And she said she's going through that whole scene with the melody, I will praise you in the storm, uh, in her head. And she was testifying of that at his memorial. So when the hypothetical question, if it's, if it's asked hypothetically about, you know, where is God when children die and things like that, um, that's one situation. But when it's somebody's experienced it, um, I fully believe with all my heart that God will give a grace in your time of need that is not experienced when you don't need it. That's why I start by saying I can't fathom that because I'm not in the position of needing that grace right now. But I do fully believe if I needed that grace, I would be provided that grace in that time of need. My kids love asking me the question, if you had a gun to your head and they said, deny the Lord, would you or wouldn't you? I'm like, well, that's a cheery Monday morning question. Um, and I said, you know what? No matter what I answer right now, I believe in that moment, I would not deny him. I would take a bullet for him. Because I believe in my time of need, I will have the grace to be willing to die for him. So it's not fair to ask when I don't need the grace. Okay, but when I need the grace, I think he'll be faithful to provide the grace to honor him no matter what the situation is. Okay. Thanks, Pastor Bill. Anybody in Parkland, Diana? Up front? If we could go lighter on the questions, that'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Other shoulder. There you go. Sorry. Hi. Um, thank you for tonight. Uh, the... Um, I had a debate for about an hour in a cab uh, with a driver who was uh, Muslim. Um, he kept telling me I was actually Muslim, and I kept telling him I thought he was a Christian deep down because we were debating, and I don't know if he just doesn't understand his mom well enough, but he said Jesus Christ was real. He was sent by God. He was a sacrificial lamb as, uh, as God provided to Abraham. So he got all the way through including being, you know, rising from the dead, just wondering conceptually, he just kept saying, well, you believe there's three gods, and I said, no, there's one, but, you know, it's the Trinity, and he said, that's the only difference we have, is I believe there's one God, and I'm just wondering if you could comment on that, because by the time I got out of the cab, I said, I think you're deep down a Christian, a Christ follower, and he said, no, I think deep down you're a Muslim, so, because I believe in one God, can you just say, Help me with that. Sure. So, um, nothing I've read on Islam would say that they believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. They actually say Judas died in his place to spare Jesus the cross. And, um, and they say that, um, you know, the, the Muslims are Ishmaelites. They're descendants of Ishmael. So they believe Abraham went up with Ishmael to sacrifice him. So uh, I've not heard that version of Islam in any Muslim book I've ever read. Um, As far as the Trinity goes, that's a true, true hang-up of theirs, for sure. Uh, In fact, our tour guide, when we were in Israel a couple years ago, we were at the Dome of the Rock, um, which, which is little nerve-wracking to visit because there are armed Muslim guards there. And the tour guy goes, 
do not go up there with the Bible and do not let them catch you praying. It's like, okay, those are two things that I do a lot. And now I'm told, don't do it in front of the guys with the guns. And, um, <clears throat> and I was told above their door, the entrance to get into the Dome of the Rock, there's Aramaic written there. And we were told that what that says is, God has no son. Which I find it interesting to walk into their holy place. They don't even promote something Islam. They actually attack something Christian. Which means Christianity has a lot of credibility. That they feel the need to do that. So, as far as them saying you believe in three gods, um, what's remarkable is I think the strongest verse about the Trinity is actually found in the Old Testament. It's uh, in De Deuteronomy 6.4. It's in the great Shema, the great call to obedience, uh, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord your God is one. Now the word one there in Hebrew is the word akad. They also have the word yakid for the number one. Yakid is when you mean one and one only. Like there's yakid podiums up here. There's one and one only. But if you ask me how many classes am I, am I teaching right now, I would not say yakid, one and one only. I would say akad. Because the one class I'm teaching is made up of a plurality of students. So when the one thing is made up of a plurality, you use the word akad. When it's Stand alone, you use Yaki. Okay? Well, in Deuteronomy 6 4, it says, The Lord your God is a God. There's a plurality within him. Um, and the word one, oh, I just did the word one, never mind. So it, it's a God, not Yaki. And then it says, The Lord your God. It's the Adonai your Elohim. So I use the word Elohim, which is a plural Hebrew word. Elohim is plural. Okay, so it says the Lord, your plural God, is a plurality of one, is what it's really saying. Okay, it sounds very Trinitarian in their great Shema. Um, and then, of course, you get stories in the Old Testament like Samson. It never says God gave him strength and power. It says the Holy Spirit came upon him mightily, right? Um, and uh, And then, of course... Uh, what I quoted earlier from John 1. Okay, so how do you explain this in a strictly monotheistic sense as far as one and one only, not a plurality of one? When it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You can't be, I can be with John, but I can't be John. Okay? Um, if you're with somebody, you can't be that somebody you're with. There's a separation there that John is trying to make clear. He was with God, and he was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then when it says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and it says, and the Word was with God, and, and like I said in the Greek, it actually says, and God was the Word. That's the word order in Greek. God was the Word. And I like that, to make it that literal from the Greek, because verse 14 then says, and that Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. It's clear as day, it's saying God became flesh and dwelt amongst us. It's clearly introducing Jesus as God. So now that that's clear, that it introduces Jesus as God, then you get to like John 17, and Jesus is praying to his Father. So it's clear that he's God, but it's also clear that he's praying to God. Okay, And he addresses him as somebody distinct from him, but then he says, if you see me, you see him. That's not true with me and my dad. If you go, can I meet your dad? And I go, don't you know if you see me, you see my father. All right? <laughs> it makes no sense. Okay? But Jesus can say, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. And he said, why is he praying to him? Because he wants to talk to him. Well, I thought he wasn't. He is. That's how it is. Is there any human comparison? No. That's why it's confounding. But to say God has to follow human understanding is to say you have a very dwarfed God. Okay. So the, the, this is the revelation God has given of himself, that Jesus is with him and he is him. What does Philippians 2 say? says, Jesus, who is in the very nature, equality with God. Can any other being say they have, in their very nature they have absolute equality with God? He did not use that equality as something to be grasped. In other words, he never said, do it because I'm God. He didn't use that against anybody. Okay, it's that he dies for them. So he has equality with God, 
And then it talks about the incredible humility of, of this God that would um, um, humble himself to the point of, a, of being a bond servant. It would be very humbling for God to become a king, an earthly king. That would be a massive step down. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said, it's more dignified for man to become a worm than it is for God to become a man. We're closer to worming this than he is to being a human being. Okay, so he really has to con himself, condescend himself to become a man. And it says he, he became uh, a, not just any man, but a bondservant. An obedient bondservant. Obedient to what? To death. That's the very curse he had to put on man. He now becomes obedient to that very curse. Puts it upon himself. And not just any death. Like it would have been enough if he was just 99 in his rocking chair and he fell asleep and never woke up. That still would be humbling. But it says, even the death of the cross. Okay, and then our famous, our favorite word is next. Therefore, you're not trained very well. Why is it there? What is it for? Yes. Therefore, God highly exalted him. See what God does with humility? He exalts the humble, doesn't he? Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that's above every name. Now, if you're a first century Jew, what's the name that's above every name? Yahweh. So he gave him the name that's above every name. And then Paul says that at the name of Jesus. So who's Jesus? Yahweh. In the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. If you look at Isaiah 45, several times in Isaiah 45, God says, I am the Lord and there is no other. So how many gods are there? One. And then he says, and, I, and to me, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Isaiah 45, he says, um, I am the Lord and there is to no other. And to me, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And what does Paul say? That in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. He is the Lord and there is no other. He's saying, I'm the fulfillment of Isaiah 45. Okay. It sounds like I have more to say, but I don't. I know I was going to say, yeah. okay, yeah. Are you done? <laughs> yeah. So we'll move on. We do have a question from the online audience. Uh, and it says, in light of what it says in Hebrews, how do you feel about alleged present day prophets? Well, <laughs> um, if if they're alleging to be like an Old Testament prophet, then there's nothing for them to prophesy. All those prophecies are pointing us to Jesus. If there's a New Testament prophecy that's been pretty well accepted and received in the church, which is not somebody who's a foreteller of future events, they're a fourth teller. In other words, they get word of truth. Like, like they can actually say to somebody, hey, you're actually not being faithful to your wife. You need to make this right. And they're like, who told you? The Lord. Just, I just got a word of truth. Okay. I had a situation years ago. Two girls that grew up together, best of friends forever, terribly fighting with one another for weeks on end, finally said, will you sit with us and try to help us work this out? And so we were sitting together, the three of us. I was in the middle. They are on either side of me. And as the one on my left kept, giving her side of the story, I was overwhelmed by the sense that this girl was very, very hurt. Not by her. She's just a hurt girl. And so I interrupted her and I turned to her and I said, who hurt you? And she bawled her eyes out and told the story of being raped and uh, never told anybody before that moment. And so I got her parents in. We actually called the police. The police got involved. And you just saw her entire countenance change because part of the problem she had with her friend was she's keeping the secret. And, you know, friends know each other well enough to be like, you're changing, what's up with you, whatever. And she just wouldn't tell anybody because that boy that raped her was associated with a local church down here. And his father was somebody in that church. So she didn't want to tell anybody. But now that she did, and it was out, and the police were actually pressing charges and things like that were happening, she felt confirmed. Wow, I am important. I am worth fussing over. And her entire countenance changed, and she was pretty much healed. 
so to speak, of what was bugging her. So I think that was like the word of truth. It was something I, I wasn't even looking at her, but I was overwhelmed with, she's, she's a very wounded girl. Yeah. So if, if they're claiming the future event, then I would have an issue with them claiming to be a prophet. If they have a word of truth or something, then I, I think that can happen. Thanks, Dustin. Probably can get one more in from either online, which there are none, or in person. Anybody? Only once? Twice? Have a good night. I guess that's it, guys. See you next week. All right. Or Sunday, if you want to come. That's right. <laughs>